kolegi, dobrodošli na Univerzi v Ljubljani, na Pedagoški fakulteti, na slavnostem predavanju profesor Majkla Epla, ki smo ga organizirali v okviru Tedna Univerze v Ljubljani. Dražne predavanje profesor Apple je še posebej pomembno, saj bo profesor Apple jutri na slavnostni seji Senata Univerze v Ljubljani prijel prestižno priznanje Častni doktor Univerze v Ljubljani. Zato najbolj prestižno univerzitetno priznanje ga je predlagala naša fakulteta in sicer zaradi njegovega izjemnega in mednarodno odmevnega znanstveno raziskovalnega dela, zlasti na področju kritične teorije šolstva. Profesor Michael Apple sicer deluje na Univerzi Wisconsin v Združenih državah Amerike na področju teorije kurikuluma in poučevanja ter študi edukacijskih politik. Njegova spoznanja so v zadnjih 30 letih postala del vednosti, ki jo posredujejo študentom z področja edukacije širom po svetu. Profesor Apple je eden najpogosteje citiranih avtorjev z tega področja. Za svoje delo je prejel številna najvišja priznanja doma in po svetu. Njegovi monografiji, ideology in curriculum in official knowledge pa sta uvrščeni na mednarodni seznam najbolj pomembnih knjig z področja edukacijskih znanosti v 20. stoletju. Svojim celotnim opusom pa se je uvrstil med 50 najbolj vplivnih sodobnih avtorjev z področja edukacije. Ponosni smo, da je profesor Apple danes z nami, da ga lahko gostimo v okviru tedna, ko častimo našo univerzo in da bo postal prvi kandidat pedagoške fakultete, ki bo dejansko prijel prestižno in zasluženo priznanje Častni doktor Univerze v Ljubljani. Now I will continue in English. I would like to welcome you, Professor Michael Apple, at the University of Ljubljana, Faculty of Education. We are very honored to host you at our faculty in a week when we celebrate our university. University of Ljubljana was established in 1919, so very soon we will celebrate our 100th anniversary. However, this school year is a very special year for our faculty because in 2017, Faculty of Education will celebrate 70th anniversary of our functioning. And in our history, for the first time has happened that a nominee from Faculty of Education will actually get Honorable Doctorate of University of Ljubljana. So I am sure that this tells us everything about your references and about your position in the educational field. I would also like to thank you to Professor Pavel Gaga and our former Dean, Professor Janis Krik, who have actually started this process. My privilege is to be part of this final stage. Thank you, Professor Apple, that you are here with us. Thank you for your lecture that you have prepared for today and congratulations for Honoris Causa of University of Ljubljana. Before you start with your lecture, I would like to invite Professor Pavel Skaga to give us some information about your scientific work, please. Apology. I will continue in Slovenian and <laughs> shift back to English later. Spoštovane kolegice in kolegi, pripadla mi je zelo sladka dožnost, da iz argumentacije ki smo jo spomladi pripravili za ustrezne komisije univerze v Ljubljani, preberem glavne dele utemelitve, zaradi katerih smo verjeli, da je naš kolega profesor Apple primiren kandidat, da se v krogu 25. fakultet te univerze poteguje za najvišjo akademsko nagrado, ki jo naša univerza podeljuje. Mimo tistega, kar smo formalno zapisali in kar bom zdaj prebral, bi vsega, Zato, ker smo na tleh pedagoške fakultete Univerze v Ljubljani, rad povedal par neformalnih stvari o našem gostu in slavljencu, ki jih sam sicer v ožjem ali širšem krogu zelo rad pripoveduje in ne mara bo tudi danske v tem reku. 
Michael Apple je pričel svojo karjero kot učitelj, razredni učitelj. In še do te kvalifikacije je prišel za zelo trdim večernim delom, izrednim študijem, kot temu rečemo pri nas. In potem se je strmo spuščal v študiji globlje in globlje in seveda končal na tistem mestu, ki ga danes verjetno vsi pripoznate. Doktoriral je na Univerzi Columbia, New York, in kmalo zatem dobil namestitev na Univerzi Wisconsin, ki je že od leta 1970 njegova matična univerza, če smemo uporabljati ta slovenski izraz. Njegov osrednji raziskovalni interes je usmerjen k kritični analizi razmeri med kulturo in močjo v edukaciji oziroma med znanjem in močjo v šolah in v širši družbi, ter k problematiki demokratizacije edukacijskih politik in praks. So svojo kritično teorijo se je med raziskovalci edukacije že v drugi polovici 70. let prejšnjega stoletja uveljavil v svetovnem merilu. Njegovo temeljno teoretično pozicijo lahko nakratko povzamemo s povzetkom iz njegovega zgodnega dela, ki je išlo leta 1979 z naslovom Ideology and Curriculum. Šole ne le, da nadzirajo ljudi, pravi avtor, pač pa tudi sodelujejo pri kontroli pomena oziroma pomenov, ker ohranjajo in razširjajo tisto, kar se dojema kot legitimno znanje, to je znanje, za katerega se predpostavlja, da ga moramo vsi imeti, Šole podeljujejo kulturno legitimnost znanju določenih družbenih skupin. To pa še ni vse. Sposobnost neke skupine, da bi svoje znanje pretvorila v znanje za vse, je povezano z močjo te skupine v širšem političnem in ekonomskem kontekstu. Na moč in kulturo torej ne moremo gledati kot na statični, medsebojno nepovezani entiteti, ampak kot na atributa obstoječih razmeri v družbi. Njegove prodorne analize izvirajo iz kritičnega premisleka položaja in razvoja izobraževanja in izobraževalnega sistema v ZDA, toda v svojem opusu jih je razširil na sodobni svetovni prostor v celoti, saj se je z njim kot gostojoči profesor in raziskovalec zelo dobro seznanil. Profesor Apple je eno izmed osrednjih svetovnih imen na področju kritične analize sodobnega izobraževanja in eden najpogosteje citiranih avtorjev z tega področja. V njegovi nad vse bogati bibliografiji lahko najdemo 16 avtorskih knjig, 28 knjig, pri katerih je nosilni urednik, 152 člankov v revijah in 210 člankov v znanstvenih monografijah, izdanih v različnih jezikih, bi pa udaril, gre za družboslovje, večje v monografijah in manje v revijah. Bil je mentor s 110. doktorantom, številna so mentorstva na njegovi domači in tuji univerzi niso šteta, ker o njih ni natančne evidence, poskušal sem ga intervjirati, okrog tega, ampak niso prišla do resne številke. Za svoje delo je prejel številna priznanja doma in po svetu, tako sta bili na primer njegovi knjigi Ideology in Curriculum iz leta 1979, knjiga je doživela tretjo izdajo leta 2004, in pa knjiga z naslovom Official Knowledge, prvi, če je šla leta 1993, druga izdaja leta 2000. Ti dve knjigi sta bili uvrščeni na mednarodni seznam najbolj pomembnih knjig z področja znanosti o izobraževanju v 20. stoletju. Se svojim celotnim opusom pa kot je bilo že povedano, se je uvrstil med 50 najbolj vplivnih avtorjev 20. stoletja na tem znanstvenem področju. Profesor Apple je prvič obiskal Slovenijo, v daljnem letu 1989, ko so bila še oba črna. Leta 1993 je kot gostojoči profesor tudi že sodeloval na poddiplomskem študiju na naši univerzi in sicer na oddelku za sociologijo kulture filozofske fakultete in pa tudi na pedagoški fakulteti. Od takrat je v plodnih kontaktih s kolegicami in kolegi tako tu na pedagoški kot na filozofski fakulteti in seveda posebej moram podariti tudi na pedagoškem inštitutu v Ljubljani. To sodelovanje je na eni strani vodilo k prenosu teoretičnih in metodoloških pristopov, ki jih je razvijal profesor Apple v slovenski raziskovalni prostor, na drugi strani pa je prispevalo tudi k uveljavljanju naših raziskovalk in raziskovalcev v mednarodnem prostoru. Že leta 1992 je išel obsežnejši knjižni izbor njegovih del v slovenskem jeziku. 
Ta vir se vse do danes uporablja kot študijski vir za naše študente in je pogosta referenca v njihovih diplomskih, magisterskih in doktorskih delih, tako na tej oziroma filozofski fakulteti, kot koliko sem uspel paziti tudi na fakulteti za družbene vede. Poleg tega je naše dosedanje sodelovanje z njim prispevalo k temu, da je bilo v slovenščino prevedenih še nekaj njegovih člankov, ki so šli po različnih vevijah. Seveda so dela profesor Epla pri nas dostopna, poznana in uporabljena tudi v izvirniku in so na ta način opazno vplivala na našo raziskovalno skupnost z tega disciplinarnega področja. Sodelovanje s profesorom Eplom je prispevalo tudi k uveljavljanju naših raziskovalk in raziskovalcev v mednarodnem prostoru, bodi si za obiski na njegovi univerzi v Wisconsin ali na drugih ustanovah v ZDA, kot tudi na nekaterih mednarodnih konferencah po svetu. Poleg tega je že od ustanovitve leta 2011 član uredniškega odbora Mednarodne znanstvene revije CEPS Journal, ki izhaja tu na naši fakulteti, kjer seveda računamo na njegovo nadaljne sodelovanje v prihodnih letih. Prav tako nadaljujemo s plodnim sodelovanjem na študijskem področju, naj omenim čisto na robu, da je njegovo zadnje gostovanje v Ljubljani potekalo na doktorski šoli tukaj le v tej hiši v začetku letošnjega junija. Zaradi odmevnosti in prepoznavnosti njegovega dela so mu izkazale čast že številne akademske ustanove po vsem svetu. Iskreno nas veseli, da bo rektor jutri profesorju Eplu zaradi njegovega pomembnega prispevka k mednarodnemu uveljavljenju in ugledu naše univerze podelil naziv Častni doktor Univerze v Ljubljani. To nas še toliko bolj upravičeno veseli, ker bo, kot je dekan že omenil, v zgodovini naše univerze prvi, ki bo to priznanje prijel na predlog tistega kroga disciplin, ki jim pač pravimo vede o izobraževanju. Skratka, s tem mislim, da sem v našem jeziku uspel pokazati vlogo in pomen slavljenca, ki je danes med nami. Zdaj pa dovoljte, da se znova obrnem v angliščino. Welcome, Mike, also on my behalf. It's just a couple of months since you were here with us. However, your first visit here, it is in previous millennium, if I remember well. Uh, this was in times, uh, in a very turbulent times for Slovenia, uh, times of, uh, let's say, building a new independent state, inside it, a new education system and so on. And I remember it was downstairs on the basement in a lecture room where we discussed can education change society <laughs> and this was in 1989 and we are now in 2019 and much has changed during this time yeah so we all here in this room are really really curious can education change society now please <laughs> for you The answer will come later, <laughs> but uh, first I want to thank uh, both Janices and Paula for the work that's been done. It is a joy to be here. Uh, Ljubljana has become something like a second home, even when I am not here. I want to thank you for sending us Donald Trump's wife. <laughs> Now, if you will accept Donald Trump in return. <laughs> please accept Donald Trump in return. Without the wife? <laughs> the wife is up to you. <laughs> if ever there has been a time when this question becomes even more difficult to answer, it is now. There is some hope in the Austrian election, though how far that hope will be, I don't know. But I am what is called an optimist with no illusions whatsoever. And uh, we have been through this before in the United States and in many, many other nations, but this is happening worldwide. So my wife, Professor Rima Apple, and I were in Brazil during the time when Gilma the first woman president of that nation, was removed from office, and the ultra-conservative neoliberal 
conservative religious advocate, is now the president. In puzzling ways, I'm pleased with this because it proves that all the writing I've been doing is correct. But unfortunately, this is not only about Michael Apple. It's about the lives of everyone in this room and elsewhere. This is serious. Now, those of you who have heard me before know that I will occasionally make jokes, uh, in part because of my pedagogic style. As some of you know, uh, I'm a former teacher in primary schools in the United States in the slums and in rural areas. And my first two and a half years, I was a substitute teacher, meaning I would call up the local Ministry of Education every morning, and they would tell me which classroom to go to. And if your last name is Apple, when you go to a new classroom every day, you must develop a very juvenile sense of humor because if you say, good morning, children, this is Mr. Apple, it will take five days for the children to come down off the light fixtures. Um, so I will occasionally be tried to be, tried to be a little humorous, but somehow I don't feel funny today. I am in a nation that uh, is making decisions not only about my own nation, what about your nation and other nations represented in this room? And it makes me feel a little nervous that the hand on the button that can release nuclear weapons all over the world is someone called Donald Trump. I want to be very honest. You will find those of you who know me know that I will not hide my politics or my ethics, but this is distressing and frightening. Okay? So I want to talk about signs of hope and hard work. Do not expect easy answers. There are none. And those of you who joined education because you felt either you were going to get rich, that was a mistake, <laughs> or you felt that it would be easy, that was actually a worse mistake. <laughs> and anyone who has ever been a teacher knows the emotional and intellectual labor that goes into doing that. And we are being disrespectful to the people who are martyring themselves in classrooms and communities and literacy programs, in Roma communities and poor communities, in all communities. We're being disrespectful if we don't treat the issues as serious. Conversations about education are not conversations about the weather. They're about the future of Slovenia, the future of the United States, and life and death as the bodies that wash up onto beaches remind us this is the lives of real children. Okay? That's it. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> I've left you feeling, it's a good thing this is not being translated, rather shitty. So, that's a technical word in English. Um, so I want to raise the issue to return to what I talked about here in 1989, with some new thoughts, as well as some old thoughts, since part of the rightist agenda is to destroy our collective memory, to forget there is a long history by many, many people in this nation and the nations represented here, and nations to be, perhaps, of dealing with these questions. They are harsh, but ultimately absolutely central. So I cannot be in education without asking this question. And if we don't, I fear for our future. So, um, I will stick to a text, but occasionally embellish it a bit. Um, much of the argument is based on a recent book called Can Education Change Society? Uh, it is on sale for three times the price outside the room. That's a joke. Um, those of you who know me know that I get no royalties for my lectures or for my books. All of the money from that goes to social mobilizations, uh, usually things such as the violence against women's shelter that is near our house. So when I may be self-referential occasionally in talking about I've said this in a book, uh, while I'd like you to read it, it's not because I wish to drive a new Mercedes. Actually, I do wish to ride a new Mercedes, <laughs> but that's about the politics of male pleasure. That's uh, about a form of masculinity in some ways. So I want us to begin to reflect on these kinds of issues. Okay. If I look there, Michael, look where you're going. Okay. So some reflections on the question. 
obviously, I think uh, many of us in this room think we need to much more think much more powerfully about education's role in society and about whether it can participate in changing society's inequalities. That seems like such a simple question. It's very hard since there is no neutral space in talking about education. There are objective spaces. We will not lie. But education in and of itself is a political act. If I know where you live in a city or a rural area and I know what your parents or significant others do for an occupation, paid or unpaid, I can predict in almost every nation of the world within one standard deviation how well you will do on any national examination. That is a political act. Something does the sorting and selecting and that is the curriculum. From the vast universe of possible social knowledge, we choose some to be official and others to be popular. In fact, as Judith Butler reminds us, as well as many other people, that it is a conceptual requirement to give meaning to things like good knowledge. We have to have its opposite in mind, whether we're conscious of it or not. Some groups' knowledge will be called popular, unimportant, illegitimate, and struggles over that are also political. Yet there's also a hidden curriculum, the norms and values that are taught, being polite, knowing when to go to the toilet, knowing as well that institutional time becomes more important, or progressive things, not your sense of progressive, but the U.S. sense and laborist sense of progressive, meaning more democratic, uh, that it is, you know, there are progressive things, such as children who are treated as purely marvelous people, come in often quite selfish. And one of the things that's important actually is they learn not to be. Education is communal, not simply individual. But it's also about money and power, and it's about the way we treat teachers. And any occupation that is seen as feminized, as women's paid work, whether it is occupied by men or women, gets less respect, less autonomy, and is blamed whenever there is a social and economic crisis. Finally, it's about which voices are heard. And the voices that are being heard throughout the world at most universities and schools are neoliberal and neoconservative. And it's possible now in many nations to say the unsayable so we can do the undoable. That is frightening, but it is real. Now, in order to understand this, I want to start out with two, two key concepts that we might want to think about as glasses that I want us to put on. The first is what is called relational analysis. The second is repositioning. Let me explain what I mean by that. Relational analysis says the following. Nothing of importance can, understood, can be understood by itself. It needs to be understood by its sets of social relations in that larger society. As an example, this podium can be seen as a set of simple physical objects. It's useful. I can lean on it. I can make bad jokes and laugh next to it, but someone made it. That means I'm now having a relationship with workers. And in my own city, as some of you know, up until a few years ago, we burned coal to produce the electricity. So when I was making the notes for my PowerPoint and my lecture today, I walked into the teacher education building at the University of Wisconsin. I walked up the stairs, I opened my office door, I turned on the light, I turned on the computer, I clicked on PowerPoint, and this is the result. That's not what happened. Yes, Michael Apple did all those things, but in my state, as I mentioned, we burn coal to produce electricity, and in order for that electricity to go on, for me to give a progressive lecture, a democratic lecture, I just had an anonymous social relationship with the miners many men and women who go underground and will die, or whose communities are strip-mined and the environment destroyed. So even for me to do my progressive pedagogic work, I now had an anonymous social relationship, but that doesn't mean it's not real with the miners whose labor I depend on. So those are the glasses I want us to put on to think about education. The second is repositioning. Whether I like it or not, I'm a white, straight, now middle class man. Even though I grew up poor and that is part of me, class is not simply a position, it's a set of memories, it's a cultural form that I hope never to lose. 
but at the same time that means I have an ethical obligation to look at the world not only through white, straight, male, member of the empire glasses, but glasses that look at the world through the eyes of women who in my classes, that when they get over at night, they must walk to the, in the dark to go to the bus. And given the economic crisis at my university, the lights have been turned down going to that bus stop and they will take out their cell phones and have a pretend conversation even when the battery is dead because there have been four rapes in the last year near my campus. My body is privileged in space. Space is about the masculine body. And for the women, they will have the phone out or walk in pairs or groups. So I must look at the world as a site of dangers that I would never face. Am I clear about that? So those are the glasses I want us to put on. So, I will try and offend everyone now at least once. If I don't at the end, would you ask me? I'm very good at it. Um, so uh, it will cost more. Um, but this is a market society increasingly. So I just want to perform neoliberalism as often as possible. Okay. That was a joke. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You must laugh at the jokes because if you don't, I will keep trying. <laughs> okay. Back to the question with these glasses. First, it's a wrong question. It's a stupid question. I said I would try and offend you. The right has already answered that question. The right is answering it in every nation of the world where it has come to power, that it understands that education has a primary role in social transformation. It is the left that is in crisis about this question. The right understands Gramsci better than anyone on the left. It knows, as I'll come back to, that this is a war of position, that everything counts. And that the struggle over common sense, the struggle over consciousness, the struggle over memory is absolutely central to radical social transformations. Just look at Austria. Okay? Just look at what just happened in the United States. So we have to understand that education goes on not only in schools, but in society. And education is a fundament for any social transformation. We have this Thermidorian vision of revolutionary impulses, forgetting Raymond Williams' concept, a brilliant concept, called this is the long revolution. And the right has struggled for 40 or 50 years to put itself in a position to be the teacher of society. And it has succeeded in almost every nation in the world where it has organized itself. So the right has answered this question in the affirmative, and I want to start there. The right is engaged in what I call in a recent a book that is the prequel to Can Education Change Society, a book called uh, um, Educating the Right Way, um, what I call conservative modernization. The right has a particular project. It is building a new hegemonic block, a new alliance, and it is willing to compromise with its own tendencies. And there are four groups in these tendencies. I want to say just a few things. It's not a lecture on previous work. I want to then go further on this. But we need to understand what the right has done. The right is made up of a new hegemonic block of four groups. The first is neoliberals, and they believe one simple thing. If it's public, it's necessarily bad. If it's private, it's necessarily good. And the more we can bring into universities, to schools, to healthcare, to everything, the more we can bring in the corporate sector and destroy the very sense of private, excuse me, oh, that was Freudian, um, of the very sense of public, the sooner we will get democracy. And they have understood that in order for that to go on, they must change common sense. They must reach into people's consciousness and connect to the elements of oppression that people feel. And the right is brilliant at doing that. If we were to have a conversation in here about a democratic school, we would talk about participatory forms, what in philosophy is called thick democracy, where teachers are respected, where students and communities have a voice, where people are not treated as if they were stupid. It would be 
thicker. And the task of dominant groups is to keep those words in circulation because they are part of an emotional economy. When we hear the word democracy, especially in a nation like Slovenia with its history, we say, yes, it's a good thing. And the task of dominant groups is to steal the language, to do what uh, Basil Bernstein and uh, many sociolinguistics uh, scholars say, we will disarticulate and rearticulate. We'll take the word democracy, pull it out of its previous meanings, and change its meaning, but still keep the word in circulation to evaluate what's a good school, a good teacher, a good university. Okay? So the task of neoliberals is to change our common sense so we think of ourselves with a new identity. We are all individuals. And our task is to make everything into the democracy of consumption practices. So as long as there is choice, not full participation collectively, but choice on a market and turn everything into a vast supermarket where everyone is known by one word, I'm a consumer and a taxpayer, by suturing those together, we will then learn what is a good school, etc. So this is a vision of what might be called the weak state. Shrink social responsibility, give it over to the market. So I am a professor at the University of Manchester and the University of London, and I do not have a department chair. I have a line manager. Notice the word, okay? a line manager. I didn't realize I was working in a factory. I'm so happy. I used to work in factories. It wasn't pleasant. Okay? Trump will change all of that for us. They'll be much more pleasant after. <laughs> Hugely present. Okay. <laughs> Weak state. Okay? You cannot have neoliberalism without something else, neoconservatism, which says strength, strength in the state over the control of knowledge, values, and women's bodies in particular. So women must not control their bodies. And neoconservative says there is a common culture, we must all share it, and it's there already. That is what Pierre Bourdieu would call an act of symbolic violence. There is nothing called the common culture. It is to be built. What is common is that we disagree, or we agree. But any democratic sense about that must have the notion that with diasporic populations throughout the world, what is common is changeable. So what is common in Slovenia needs to be defended. But Slovenia is not this thing that occurred hundreds of years ago. It is in motion. So my own city where I was born, Patterson, New Jersey, used to be 40% Latino, 40% African American, and 20% people who look like me. It is now the second largest Arabic speaking city in my own nation. What is common is a little different, okay? So what is common is a problem. And that's to try and answer the question with every generation, what is common? That is not to be disrespectful, it's to be respectful of the vitality. Slovenia, the United States, England are experiments. They are not the same. To be proud of where one comes from says we are in motion. And there will always be tensions between what is there and what is to be. Oddly enough, that's the task of education, to prepare people for what is to be as well as what is there already. So neoconservatism wants to cement in place similarity. You can't have neoliberalism without it. For a market to be set loose in schools with voucher plans and other, or public funding for private schools at 100%, okay, you must have good schools be recognized. You must have a metric. That means teachers must teach exactly the same thing. So if Paul is teaching mathematics, and it's a different mathematics than I'm teaching, I don't know whether he's a good teacher or I'm a good teacher. I must have the same thing taught by every teacher. So neoliberals will promise we'll have democ democracy, you can send your child to any school you want, an art school, a science school, a ballet school. That's the fiction. In every nation of the world where the market has been set loose, the first thing is a restoration of a common without the ease of changing it. 
and then a demand that teachers be evaluated on that. And it was our beloved President Barack Obama who put in place performance pay for teachers. So teachers in the United States, their salary is now based on the test scores. That is the future. There's a third group that we might want to call authoritarian populists. These are growing throughout the world. It's a group that believes what is wrong is that we have lost God. God only speaks to them. It doesn't speak to, uh, to other people. This is a group that says capitalism is God's economy. And we can see this, for instance, in Palestine and Israel. And as someone of Jewish heritage, I find it very painful to say, but this is in many ways a religious and fascist state. The way it treats Palestinians is absolutely murderous. We can see this in Pakistan, in India with the Hindutva movement, and in other places as well, where the answer is a rest restoration of this theocratic vision. And by the way, the fastest growing school reform in the United States is not neoliberalism. It is not a common culture. It is homeschooling. Five million children have been pulled out of public schools and religious schools and are being schooled at home. I quote, teachers are tools of the devil. I only wish that is the case. That was not a joke, by the way. Okay. Then finally, there is what we want to call new managerialism. These are the groups who believe one simple thing. If it moves in classrooms, measure it. And if it hasn't moved yet, measure it anyway in case it moves tomorrow. They believe one thing, a good teacher can be known only by test scores. There is no evidence whatsoever to support the relationship between higher test scores and being a good teacher. What there is is a correlation between that and teachers feel like, feeling like they're losing their autonomy and respect. So this group looks forwards to an economy of a particular kind and backwards to a mythical past that never existed. So all, these, all of these show that schools can participate in changing society. It has always been the case. The question is, what kind of society? So what can we learn from these groups that are winning? You know, forgive it's painful to say this, the groups who are winning. So the fact, for instance, in Austria, that it was close, that it's possible in Austria for something like this to happen, says, hmm, the fact that Donald Trump, I'm about to cry, uh, Donald Trump can be my president when he is a rapist and has admitted it in public. And people, 53% of white women voted for Donald Trump in the United States. Let me repeat that. 53% voted for Donald Trump says something's going on here. There is a vast social and pedagogic project that the right is performing. It is a pedagogic project. So what the right can teach us is that this is a war not of maneuver but a war of position. Okay? So war of maneuver, you are unfortunately all too familiar of these. these. This is World War I, where Michael has troops on my side in a trench, and Giannis has troops over there, and Giannis and Michael yell at exactly the same moment, charge! And whoever is left standing wins. That is not current politics. What Gramsci reminds us is that transformations of common sense, the generation of consent, are crucial to any social transformation, and that this is a war of position. Everything counts. Textbooks, teachers, where a highway is built, who gets health care, who doesn't. Everything counts. Libraries and keeping them open or closing them. Salary, homelessness, where people sleep, control of women's bodies, how one treats people of different religions. Everything counts. And the task then is to suture them together so that they form a block and push society in particular directions. That's the rightest project and they are proving it to be successful. So wars of position, everything counts. And there's a significance then of a struggle over consciousness and common sense. An example of democracy becomes an example of that. We all love democracy, 
that the task is to keep the word in circulation and change its very meaning so that social justice takes care of itself as long as the world is a vast supermarket. It's Adam Smith without Adam Smith. Adam Smith in Wealth of Nations, page 313, I think, in the English language edition, said the following, for every one rich man, there must be 500 poor ones. That's by the founder of capitalist theory. That's a brilliant statement. He's wrong in arithmetic. It's about a million. Okay? Okay? But he wasn't good in math and not so good in economics, actually. Um, but there is clearly okay, a sense in which identities are being transformed. So that means that education is a crucial site of struggle. It always has been. And we misrecognize that. It has already been shown. And that means that there is an importance of curriculum, teaching, and policy. Let me give an example of that right now. In the United States right now, we have a new national history curriculum. It's in all the textbooks. And it says this, we are all immigrants. We all have the same history. That sounds very democratic. So my relatives who came from Russia and Ukraine, right, and part of what was now Poland but used to be Russia, right, we'll see how long that lasts, unfortunately. Um, and that wasn't a joke, actually. But it's actually <laughs> So um, that, that says we have capitalism in the economy, but we all have the same history. Well, let me remind you, if you don't know already, that it was official US government policy in the, um, that is unknown to most people to give smallpox infected blankets to American Indians, to indigenous people. Millions died. That was a government state policy. That doesn't sound like immigration to me. That sounds like mass homicide. Three to five million African people who were brought as enslaved people to the United States. No one is ever a slave. Slavery is a relation. It's not a noun. It's a verb. Three to five million enslaved people died in the ships before they reached the Americas. That's not immigration. That's genocide. I'm using purposely emotional examples to say this is really, really important. And the struggle over that by teachers and in the curriculum is absolutely central to our understanding of my nation. I would not be here. I come from poverty. There would be no US economy were it not for enslavement. I owe a debt that I can never repay. I'm not talking about this is not for me. Every nation has its own hidden history. The struggle over that is absolutely central. So, we still have to be cautious about using words. I've now tried to document, and I'll come back to that in a second, that education is fundamental to social transformation, and the right is proving that every day. But we, count, we code it with this language of society. Can education change society? That's a lazy word that also has no meaning. Okay, so in many ways, I want to now draw from Wittgenstein and Austin, and Austin's book, um, How to Do Things with Words, reminds us that language can do many, many things. Describe, explain, control, legitimate for political maneuvering. Wittgenstein says, never ask the meaning of a word. Look at its use. Who's using it for what purposes? So words like society are dangerous words. It's like the word we, which is the most dangerous word in the English language, we. It's exclusion as much as inclusion. So, society is a place marker for more complex and, and specific understandings. When we ask the question, can education change society? We have to ask, what do you mean by society? This whole thing out there? That's a very, very good excuse for inaction. Because Michael can't change that thing out there. I used to work in factories. I don't work in factories now. Does that mean I have to wait until labor gets its act together and transforms factories? So this is a lazy word. It's not a useful word. It ignores the important gains we've made in our political understandings over the past. Does that mean that the state struggles over it, over the courts? 
over legislation about women's rights, over legislation about schooling, has no place because I have to wait for this thing that glows in the dark on weekends called society. So if I were to ask you, can you change society? You'd probably look at me like I was crazy. Yeah. What, what do you mean? Well, that's the question. What do we mean? We tend to use it for a metaphor about the economy. But political and cultural spheres are absolutely crucial. Long revolutions do not occur like the Russian Revolution and its myth. Sailors came off the boats, they occupied St. Petersburg and then other places, and guess what? Everything changed really quickly. That's a bit ahistorical. Right? And the history of Slovenia is also a counter-narrative to that. It took many, many decades of work in which cultural and political battles were fought, as well as economic ones. But this thing that we have, that this thing out there, means that we don't have to do anything in education. It's out there. It also uh, tends to be class essentialist. Yet there are multiple relations of power. Class, gender, race, ability. Isn't that part of society as well? So what we're saying basically is, well, women's understandings are nice if you can get it, but they're not important to society. Right? Well, those of you who are teachers now or at universities know how much sacrifice has been made for women to be at this university and to be respected. Is that not part of society? So it minimizes the stuff that we do. That's extraordinarily dangerous conceptually and literally is destructive in terms of who we think we are and what we have to do. Because if words like society can lead to cynicism and a lack of action. It's too big. And finally, let us remember that schools are key parts of society, not something outside it. So what do schools do? And this is now the crucial part. Let us pretend that Michael Apple is a second international Marxist. Some have accused me of being that. That's not true. But let's assume that I'm really reductive. Everything is class all the time. So women's struggles, or Roma struggles, or anything like that, that'll be nice after the revolution. Right now I've got to focus on the economy. Let's pretend that's my, that my, that's my position. By the way, if you ever read Marx, that is not his position. Uh, that's, you know, that's sloppy. That's just lazy scholarship. Uh, so, let us remind ourselves that schools, even if you believe that, schools are places where people work. Let me repeat that. Schools are places where people work. That sort of makes them part of the economy, if I remember correctly. So they are integral parts of the economy as workplaces and as sites of profit. Teachers work for pay. School secretaries work there. The women who cook the lunches work there. The people who clean the buildings work there. That is gendered and classed. And in my own nation, it is fully raced. So the women who clean the buildings of men are often people of color. The people who cook the food for the children are often poor women. Secretaries are usually women. <coughs> and the vast majority of teachers, especially at primary and middle schools, are women. So there's gender division of labor, a racial division of labor. That is the economy. So words like society, again, give us an easy excuse not to focus on the transformation and struggles within the economy itself. And there is no difference between schools and insurance companies and driving buses, except in salary and prestige, that we are watching the proletarianization of teaching throughout the world. So even if we believe in essentializing forms of political economy, schools are integral parts of that economy. And that means if, if we are even reductive, if we don't defend teachers' autonomy and teachers' rights, we are not working in the economy. That's actually crucial to any political mobilization. Otherwise, we are telling teachers and others who work at universities and elsewhere, the right has a home for you because we think that your work is not very important. That is tactically insanity. 
And the right, I assure you, is perfectly willing for that to happen. In fact, that is part of their overt agenda. But schools are crucial about the politics of official knowledge. In order for people to see themselves as part of larger social transformations, they have to have identities, and those identities are being transformed. And a politics official of official knowledge is also a politics of people's lives and their histories, and a politics of whose math is taught, what kind of mathematics is taught, what kinds of science is taught, what kinds of history and literature is taught, in order for people to see themselves as having agency that has to be connected to their lives. And if we don't have that, it's okay, it's the CIA, but just checking to see. <laughs> that wasn't a joke. <laughs> okay. It's now Trump's CIA. Oh my God. <laughs> The reason I'm in Slovenia is because you have good Schlivovitz. And right after this lecture, I want to have a loss of collective memory. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> All right. Back, back to the issue of official knowledge. So let me give an example of this. Okay. So right now, for instance, there is a new mathematics called the Algebra Project in the United States, in which students who are of color and very poor Normally, about 90% of them never succeed in mathematics. Math is the sorting device in our middle schools. So they are seen as, I quote now, this is a hor horrible word, as retarded. Okay? It's a word I'd like purged. Okay? The Algebra Project says it is crucial, it's gumption, that we must teach students who are poor elite knowledge. It's already been paid for by their labor and the labor of their parents. So it's communal knowledge. But how do I make it plain to them? How do I create an identity where they're not driven into gangs, where they see themselves as having agency and being smart? But one of the things that, that uh, the city of Baltimore did with the Algebra Project was to say, the common core you're supposed to get is algebra and statistics. Let's make this into a problem. The government wants to build a new juvenile prison we need mathematics to show that crime rate has gone down and what happens to youth when they are arrested. So their entire mathematics curriculum was based on that and they formed an alliance with the Occupy movement and with critical journalists and television anchors and they mobilized for one year. Their study of mathematics was a redefinition of official knowledge taking elite mathematics and using it to stop the prison from being constructed. The prison has not been constructed. And by the way, they scored two standard deviations higher on the national mathematics examinations. Okay? So this is what we mean about the struggle over official knowledge as an interruption of things. Hence, schools are identity creators. And struggling over the possibility of seeing oneself as having agency is transformative. But schools have also historically been sites of movement creation. You cannot understand black liberation struggles throughout the world as an example, or women's liberation struggles throughout the world, throughout the world or Roma liberation struggles throughout the world, unless you understand how important children are to people's lives. And generation after generation of parents and community activists have said, you did it to me, you cannot do it to my children. And the sites of struggle have not always been in the economy. They have been in schools and community organizations. And that struggle, even if it fails in the schools, creates new identities. And it creates a sense of tactics. And even failure teaches us that it is possible to mobilize. And schools become crucial sites. In the United States, you cannot understand the black movement at all unless you understand that if you were enslaved, you could be killed if you were taught how to read. Literally, you could lose, lose your life. So the struggle over literacy was absolutely central to almost every further struggle in the economy, in the state, and in cultural form. It is ahistorical to answer the question, can education change society negatively? It is a performance in the United States of whiteness. 
it says, well, maybe it didn't hurt, it didn't help me. That means it didn't help anybody. That is whiteness personified. Hence, schools then are sites of developing and learning tactics. Even when we fail, we learn what didn't work. Not all social mobilizations are successful. Surprise, surprise. Okay. And then schools have historically been sites of social experimentation. And in Can Education Change Society, about a third of the book is on exactly that. It's on places like Porto Alegre, Brazil, where the state was elected as a democratic socialist government. And the first thing they did was to say, we will change the school so that everything will be democratized. Teachers will be paid one month's salary to go into the community every year for one month, and the parents and community activists and children will act as their teachers. So that when you get the official curriculum, you can connect it to the lived experience of the youth. That's brilliant. But it also meant that you had to participate with the community and even principals of the schools must be elected with community voices, not just voices, but votes. That's very interesting to me. So here we see schools then as being powerful places for the learning of further mobilization around democracy. And it could not be done in other institutions. It was done in the school. That says something about where we get our knowledge from. It means that the South needs to teach the North. It means that Slovenia, the United States, and England need to look sometimes not just here, but elsewhere, where people even have fewer resources and are democratizing. It's not to romanticize it. There will be mistakes made. It's called being human. <coughs> so what's our place in this now? Right. So. We are very good at now answering the question, supposedly, yes, education can change society. Again, I said it's the wrong question. It's always been that. So, what about people like Michael and others in this audience who may be at universities or working in education? If we want to do this, what does it mean? What's our tasks? So this is now the template for the new book. This is rules for us. I'm sort of tired about people in education telling other people what to do. Though I think I, we should not have false modesty. I'm not asking anyone to commit suicide intellectually. Okay? The right is anti-intellectual. If the left is equally anti-intellectual, we have lost the battle before we begin. Many of us in this room were not supposed to be here. I grew up very, very poor. Very poor. Okay? I'm here because people sacrificed. And for many women in this audience, the history of universities throughout the world is that women were not supposed to apply. For many people who are working class and poor, or even who are now from middle class, you are here because generations of people have sacrificed to get you here. That means that they've already paid for whatever knowledge we have. And if we don't not just accept it, but accept it saying it's not just a gift, real lives enabled me to be here. That's absolutely central to any political project and any pedagogic project. And it means then that unless we keep doing the kinds of theoretic and empirical and historical work, we are saying all the labor that these people engaged in is unimportant. That's even more important for people who are going to be teachers or are who are teachers now. Because that struggle is absolutely central. And if I hear at more sort of anti-theory, anti-intellectual stuff, the right, that's their thing. We are opening the space for the right to enter. Okay? All right. So what are our tasks? First is what I want to call simple, that we're good at. And it's harder and harder to do, and that's simply telling the truth. In biblical terms, in the English language Bible, um, simply saying, bearing witness to negativity, telling the truth. Okay. Not simply saying, well, I get money over here because the government is funding that, which sometimes we must compromise in order to pay graduate students funding and things like that. But 
we must, no matter what, take it as our responsibility to tell the reality. A good example of the power of that right now in my own nation is the following. The right in the United States says that the U.S. is a Christian nation. It always has been, it always will. There is brilliant new archaeological and historical evidence to show that the people who actually built through their physical labor the United States, people of African heritage and descent, stolen from that continent. Okay? So they did the labor. So again, I would not be here. There'd be no industry in the North except for the enslavement of millions of people in the South. Okay? That one third of them were Islamic, Muslim, and were perfectly literate in Arabic. Hmm. That truth is absolutely central to a political project. That is, that underpins the sense of debt, not guilt, but a sense that I owe something. Not just to my family that sacrificed for me to be here, but I owe something to some other people's families too. And that means that the policies in education and elsewhere must show that debt. Okay? So we tell the truth. But telling the truth can also lead to cynicism. What we don't need is teachers and professors and community organizers saying, there's nothing we can do. It's all bad out there. It's what my children used to say when I would get like this. They'd say, that's daddy's oh shit response. Okay? Oh shit. It's so complicated, nothing I can do. Well, sometimes that's true, but what we don't need as a political project or a pedagogic project is to make people feel, oh shit. There's nothing I can do. That's not a very effective strategy. Okay? Though sometimes it's true. Okay, so here I want to borrow a bit from a particular leftist tradition, the language of contradiction. Things are not yeses and nos. Things are contradictory. So part of our task is demonstrating that there are spaces for action. And they're being created all the time. So neoliberalism wants us all to think of ourselves as consumers, as people who purchase our societies and make choices on a market, and that destroys community. Yet we seem to have a need for sociality. <coughs> so that space is being created by neoliberalism, a space for people who say, I feel sort of alone here. I want to join with others through the arts, through mobilization, through joy in the body, through yoga, through almost anything. Through women's reading groups, through many, many things. The right answer is that with the church. Okay? But that space is there. So the second task, in many ways, is to show the spaces of possibility. It's not all neoliberalism all the time. There are spaces that are being opened at exactly the same moment. But we have to then act as the critical secretaries of these critically democratic spaces. Saying that there's spaces is fine, but unless we document that there's good stuff going on in many of these spaces, it's simply rhetorical. And so part of the task at universities in particular is for us to change what counts as scientific research and to actually be documentarians of good stuff. Okay? That's abso absolutely central. Otherwise, again, we create cynicism. Then the task as well is keeping traditions alive critically. As I mentioned, there's a loss of collective memory. And that means that we must, in fact, be part of a project of restoring the memories. So teachers' unions, by the way, in the United States and in England were women's organizations. They were the first women's unions. That's very important for people to understand. So we must restore the collective memory of criticism, of critical theory, of serious historical work, and that requires that we be better at it than the right. So we have to keep these traditions alive, but critically. Then we have to give this knowledge that we have keep, kept alive to movements, to groups. It can't just be that we are talking and pretending that they are listening. A good example of that um, is the fact, again, that we do not wish to, to commit class suicide here. 
we are keeping this alive for real people. We are in many ways the keepers of a particular flame in education. I'm reminded of a voice of my father. Uh, some of you have heard this story before. Uh, when, a new, when Educating the Right Way came out and it won the National Book Award in Education, which is nice. Right? Uh, and I began to say, was this all it's about? For me to win another damn award, which I love. So thank you at University of Ljubljana. I mean, these are very special things. But it was when I was teaching in primary school, when I taught someone to read, I saw it. It was immediate. And here I am writing and lecturing, but I can't see the transformations. I miss that. So I want to see my father, an old commie died as a Maoist. Don't ask, the last Maoist alive in the United States. And I said to him, Harry, now he knows it's serious now because I said him by his first name. Harry, I am not sure this is right. Does this make any difference in the world? And as you walk into his little assisted living apartment, is this, set, this bookcase that you can't miss with Rima Apple and Michael Apple's books and photographs of Rima and me giving lectures. And he says, what? I said, I'm not certain this makes a difference. And he comes up like, I won't do it. Literally in my face, screaming at me. So he's breath and spitting. You'll forgive my father never swore, but I must quote my father, a former, you know, no longer with us, communist, who always wore a tie when he went to be arrested, because you must respect working class people. Okay? And he looked at me and said, Michael, what the fuck did you just say? Can we turn off the tape recorder for a minute? <laughs> But this, you know, I'm like this, this is not my father, and it's, huh. that is the most disrespectful thing you have ever said in your lives. In your, life. your mother and I and the entire family sacrificed. You are the first generation finishing secondary school in this family. We sacrificed for you to bring this back. Your task is to take what you now know because we've already paid for it, I quote, with our damn lives. Give it back. That is the smartest thing about pedagogy I have ever heard in my entire life. So from the words of someone who never finished secondary school on time, a printer, craftsperson, comes part of what we must know, which is learning who we are and what the sacrifices were, and to give it back. But in order to give it back, we need to be able to speak and write in different levels. And the right is brilliant about that. Absolutely brilliant. They speak plain folks, English, or Espanol, or Portuguese, or German, or Slovene. They speak plainly. Often when I speak, you need a postmodern dictionary. Right? What did he mean when he quoted from Foucault? Now, I think Foucault is quite a smart guy, actually. He does not replace some of the traditions that I think are crucial in any way. We romanticize it because it's French, but that's a different issue. So we must learn how to work at different levels. And that requires the development of new skills and the relearning of skills, of journalism, of working with the media. And if we don't do that, I assure you, we will lose. And there are people in this room who have been my teachers about how to do that because that's nothing new for Slovenia about learning how to work at multiple levels. And that requires that universities also, and the role of the professor, be that of a public intellectual as much as possible. That also means we must never stand on the balcony. Our position is not up here, what um, Karl Mannheim called the unattached intelligentsia. Standing above it all, having no class position, we are good sociologically, we comment, but don't ask, the, act us, ask us to act. It's a very dangerous position. And as Bakhtin reminds us, the balcony has a very, very interesting history. It occurs in its European version uh, with particular kinds of iterations. And those iterations are 
when the new bourgeoisie begins to evolve and there is carnival in the streets. An architectural form evolves where you stand above the carnival of people actually talking back to power one week a year. So you get a politics of pleasure by saying, look at that. Look at the talking back. Look at the music. Look at the profanity. Wow, it's beautiful. Am I glad I'm up here? The unattached intelligentsia is not a role. Again, we can be objective, but we are not acting is a form of action. And that means we must join with these movements, cultural and political as well as economic ones. And I think that these must be reflected in our commitments to one to our teaching as well. That is, it can't simply be rhetorical. If we don't demonstrate it, how can we expect our students to demonstrate it as well? And that means acting as a mentor and model for one's students. As flawed human beings who try and take these tasks seriously, we will make mistakes. Well, I don't know. I'll make mistakes. You are perfect. Okay? But we must be aware that we will need to be taught and criticized, and we must try to reposition ourselves, knowing that we may fail at times. Okay? And then finally, we must expand the spaces for those who are not here. So, Slovenia is changing. The United States is changing. England's empire has come home. What does that mean? Okay. Who is not in this room? What is my ethical responsibility to people who are not in this room to be in this room? What would it require? Okay. So, I forgot all about this. <laughs> It would have been an act of solidarity if you had said, Michael, okay. <laughs> we're now here. <laughs> you realize I must now start over again. <laughs> okay, so the last, this is now the conclusion. Okay, so with this, how do we think about interrupting dominance? First, as I mentioned, not acting is acting. It's not a choice. Right? So not acting on the issue of can education change society guarantees that education will, but not with our voices. Okay? So we need concepts such as non-reformist reforms and not turn it into simple neo to simple neoliberalism, <coughs> that is to simple reformism. We need to say there's a million things that have to get done in education and elsewhere right now. If we are to act, we must act on those things. And this is Andre Gortz's concept. Uh, we must act in such a way so that it opens other doors. So we do those things that further politicize, that further open other possibilities, knowing that there's a million things we have to do. So we can't do all million. We choose those things that serve to open further spaces of action. We need to engage in a critical media project, and I spend a lot of time on that in, in Can Education Change Society? That is using the media much more clearly and much better. Um, and that means, for instance, that we occupy spaces in Twitter, right? not just Donald Trump tweeting one more foul thing, we have to engage in documenting the successes. The right is very good about saying that education can make no difference. It's a scene of disaster. I don't know about you, but I've been in a lot of schools. There's stuff going on where my jaw simply drops, where I just say, I wish you could be the teacher of my children. So part of our task is making it visible that there are successes to reduce cynicism. But we also, there's the crucial importance of being self-critical. As I said before, unless we also stop acting in arrogant ways, pushing people towards the right, it's not just the right is creative, the left has stagnated in some ways. There's a return to second international Marxism. I know that that's the case here among some groups. It's certainly the case in the United States. This is a mistake. It is a, a very, very real mistake. So if you want to tell me to go back to the sacred texts, I will agree with you, but I want them read carefully. 
then we have to ask, who is the we? Who would I include in this? And it seems to me, unless we are willing to challenge the accepted definitions of the we, to listen to women's voices as they walk with the phone, as an example, we will fail. The right is mobilizing that. We have to ask who are allies and who are not. <coughs> we need lessons to be learned from all of the past struggles. I'll give one example of this in closing. When our governor and government in the state of Wisconsin said that unions will dissolve among public workers every year. So there's no such thing as a permanent union. On December 31st, the union dissolves. It must have a new election and 50% plus one person of all the union members have to vote for the union or the union goes away permanently every year. A quarter of a million people occupied the Capitol building, slept there, and the police didn't arrest anyone. The police slept with the resistors and protesters. It's a remarkable achievement, a remarkable achievement. Members of minoritized groups came in support. Disability rights people came in support. Immigrants came in support. And it was minus 27 degrees. And they marched. Brilliant. The next week was a, uh, a march for immigrant groups <coughs> demanding rights. Not one member of the Public Service Workers Union, not one member of the Teachers Union marched with them. Not one. Can I, can I suggest that perhaps that was a bad error? Okay. And many of those immigrants then said, the left has nothing to give me. Okay. So again, we must ask, who are our allies and what are the mistakes that we have made in the past? And that means we need decentered unities, broad alliances, otherwise we will lose. Okay. And this requires thinking about class in complicated ways, in intersectionality, and all kinds of things. But let's be honest. We must never be romantic. But hope is a powerful resource. We have been through this before, constantly. So we should never, th we should think of ourselves, what, how I describe myself, as optimists with no illusions whatsoever. And again, returning to one of the main things, we must think of the gains that have been made over the years and the sacrifices they have required. There is no easy way out of this. I want to end with a little phrase, and I want you to think about this. I want to use one example, the example of Seawall. This is a group of children in China who two years ago were on a ferry on a school trip with their teachers going to a nature reserve to do environmental education on an island off the coast of Seoul. Okay? A regular thing that teachers do. And because of neoliberalism, the government, under a right-wing minister of education and right-wing president and right-wing legislature, said, there's too much government regulation. We need freedom for entrepreneurship. And the ferry company then had no inspection. None. And the ferry company said, we can double the size of the passenger cabin on this ferry. And that meant that the top was very, very heavy. And one wave came as the children were on their way to the island. And it went like this. And 412 children drowned with their teachers. That's neoliberalism. So we owe it to the children of Seawall, to the teachers and community activists who came before us, to the workers who have been exploited, to those who have died and have been in prisons. We owe it. We owe it to all of them. We owe it to ourselves so that we can do what is possible for us. And we owe it to many more people to continue the struggle for an education that's critically democratic. 
So I want to end with a seawall story to remind us what is at risk here. If we let the right answer the question, can education change society? And we continue the lamentable habit of saying it's too big. And we don't think about our role in the long revolution. There will be more seawalls. I refuse to accept that responsibility. And I assume anyone in education who takes that seriously understands the history of this. Thank you for your patience. Thank you.